Hey, Bambos. This is our greatest. This is the greatest. <laughs> this, is, this is like, you don't know how many months or weeks I've been dreaming of doing this. On Floating heads. Yeah. Talking heads. Talking heads. <laughs> oh, this is fantastic. And I even see we've got our guest on. We've got Dr. Cindy Milligan joining us today. Yes. Yes. She Little did she know she was going to be talking to heads that are floating in the sky. She certainly <laughs> will not have joined this show if she thought that was going to be happening. <laughs> we're going to be talking to Dr. Cindy Milligan, and we're going to talk about finding your voice. and So much more. A lot, lot more. On a wonderful K. Oh, nice. Cheers. Our cups are back. Cups are back. Thank for, you for allowing us this moment of immaturity. That's It gives my life such great joy not needing to be an adult. Are you kidding me? I'm so in there. I could float my head every day. That would be like, I could so do that. I think we're going to have to start improv. Like maybe like put it like a hoodie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'd, like to, I'd like to interview a person with the green screen all over our faces. So basically we cannot see a thing the whole way. That would bring me great joy. But uh, you forget that we can also just do we could just disappear. We could fade away into fade the dark. away. We could do like a Star Trek moment. Now we're going to reappear. Energize. Energize. Bring Energize. Us, bring us back in. And then we are. <laughs> oh, oh, you're my. chill. You're a child. Yes, you're I am. a child. My mother says that you never grow up. Uh, Cindy Milligan. I think we woke her up. So she she knew she had an eight o'clock meeting. Little did she know she was going to be live broadcasted. That I don't think. We'll have to find out. Normally, before we start a show, there's two questions we ask every individual. The first question is what? Is there anything we do not discuss on the show? Because we will go anywhere. So anywhere. Anywhere. So, Cindy, you'll have to say, don't talk about my first X, my second X, my third X, or whatever you don't want to talk about. You can write it in the chat, and we won't go there. Yeah? It can be really anything. In, and Andy... And Likes to go to sex, so also include oh, that. Look, at, honestly, <laughs> you're really going to put that up my feet? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I see her typing, so clearly there will be topics. <laughs> and then the second thing is, do we, do we use uh, strong language or not? Some people don't like when we use strong language. Other yeah. people don't care. Yeah. So if you do or don't want strong language, then go ahead and just write a comment. Let us know. No sex, Andy. Okay. No, no exes. exes. <laughs> I don't mind strong language. That's great. Great. Uh, okay. So we'll stay within those bandwidth. Little did she know. She didn't watch a show. She just said, sure, I'll join your show, not knowing what she was in for. So um, I saw uh, Cindy. This is a great subject. I think it's great. What makes you say it's great? Well, even in the time when I was giving uh, connection games workshops, uh -huh. what I saw a lot of people struggling was finding and sourcing their voice to to um, speak their truth. Mm. And I can connect that to the hashtag Me Too movement in a way because what I saw there were quite a few women in the group, mm. even one man actually, who couldn't say the word no this is not okay mm. and instead of that there was a shutdown right and yeah. i mentioned the hashtag me too because we mentioned it quite a few times in, the, in our last shows yeah, yeah so that's where my brain goes directly yeah. and i think for cindy we'll talk to her but she's actually coaching or 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 orators so people who will be speaking publicly and we'll see how much that's connected into say people who feel like their vest voice has been um suppressed suppressed or, or held back yeah um you don't have a problem though do you you know I, i've often felt in my throat that's where i felt the pain right you know that's where i felt like when i would talk i had <clears throat> i had uh i would say when i feel deep pain i feel it in my throat mm. so if i watch a film or something that really touches me and i can't allow the motions to come up then i get a sore throat I have, yeah. Mm. Yeah. And I think you'll know, like, I'll just randomly like to yell in the house. 
and there's some release and just making up reasons to yell for no apparent reason. Yeah. It just feels ah, letting out all that energy. So it would be nice to discuss with Cindy. We know absolutely little about her except for her profession and that she serves a lot of people in this area. So we'll get to get, normally we have about five minutes to discuss that beforehand, but now we can discuss it automatically. So without further ado, we bring on Cindy. Hello, Dr. Cindy. Hi. Hi, guys. Good morning. Good morning to you. How early is it for you? It's not really early at all. It's uh, just around 11. Oh, yeah. So the first question I have for you is about your sex life. I'd like to know. (laughs) (laughs) The first rule of the show is avoid half the questions. Okay. (laughs) Please. Um. Thank you for joining yeah. us. I was oh, you're welcome. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Already it's been a wonderful chaos. Yes. Yes, it has did, been. did you wake up like that? Or this is like you took time? Oh, I woke to... up like this. This is Beyonce. <laughs> nice. I love it. <laughs> when when did you know that you were going to be teaching other people how to use their voice? When did that happen? Wow. Um I've always been really fascinated with voice. I got fascinated because when I was really little, my mom taught me to read and she has an incredible voice. Really? It's this really rich alto voice. And she would read to me. And, you know, when she would read, she would like do all the characters and add sound effects and stuff. And I was like mesmerized. Um, And then when I got into school, there wasn't a whole lot, you know, as far as classes or teaching. I didn't really learn much more about using the voice other than from her until I got to high school and took a speech class, right? But there was only one public speaking class in high school. Mm, yeah. So I just kind of really had to dig out you know, other opportunities, but I was on the debate team. I did some poetry reading, stuff like that, where I could use my voice. But it wasn't until I actually had trouble and pain with my voice that I sought out a, vo- a voice coach to help me. And after I worked with her for a while, it totally changed the sound of my voice. And she said, Oh, I think you'd be really great at voiceover. And I was Mm -hmm. like, yeah, let's go. (laughs) So she introduced me to her talent agent in San Francisco and I started doing voiceover. And then the rest of it was just like historical data. Wow. When was the last time you lost your voice? Oh, gosh, that's a really good question. I can't remember the last time I lost my voice. Yeah, Probably in high school when I was a screaming, screaming maniac at a football game. So, so you've never had a situation where someone verbally abuse, is abusive and then you have no words to put on the table? Oh, so I have words. <laughs> <laughs> I like her. <laughs> I have words. And one of them is the F word, Bambos. Yes, I'm (laughs) sure that is, Mr. Shaila. I have a question. I actually felt very emotional when you spoke about your mom reading Uh, to you. Yeah. And and when you talked about her putting character voices on. And it's it's so intriguing for me in life when when I uh, look at the influences in my own life that I didn't it didn't necessarily I took for granted until I got mm-hmm. older and realized, wow, there were things that I learned without even knowing it. Right. And so how much of that did you kind of find in a weird way, like connecting almost with your mom in this journey? Well, that's a really interesting question because my mom, um, she was a singer, but she only used her singing voice in church. And she had this really rich alto voice. Now, I didn't follow after her as far as singing, but the spoken human voice is really where I focus. And so um, I think the the most important part of it was she always taught me to never bite my words. She said, if you have a question, ask your question. There are no stupid questions. Say what you need to say. You know, and if people accept it, they accept it. If they don't, they don't. But don't hold it back. So I think that was probably one of the things that even sticks with me today, because she would always say, stand on your own two feet. 
And I remember the first time she said that to me, I was like, do I have any other feet to stand on? What do you mean yeah. by that? But I really experienced that because probably about 10 or 11 years ago, I fell down some stairs and broke a bone in my foot. Mm. And having to stand and having to stand even using crutches was so difficult. And mm. it just drained me of energy. And that was one of the things when it really stuck with me, you know, that has that stand on your own two feet has mm. multiple meanings, right? Literally to be able to have the energy to stand physically on your own two feet. Uh, and then the whole concept of standing up for yourself when yeah. you need to stand up for yourself. If you had to, just to help us sort of feel into this, if you had to imitate your mom's voice, could you tell, could you let us hear what your mom's voice would sound I like? Couldn't, I couldn't do it. I don't think I could do it. Um, and that would be because? She, her voice is much was much lower than mine. Um, her voice is much richer than mine. There was a little bit of a texture. I don't want to say she didn't have a raspy voice. It was very clear, but I I I don't think I could do it. Wow. Yeah. That's that's interesting. No one's ever asked me that. I could do my dad's voice. I just need to start shouting at you. <laughs> Cindy, how, 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 do you, how do you define richness? Because if I don't hear your mother speak and I'm here with you present, uh -huh. like I sense richness mm. and texture. So how do you define richness? Well, with her, I would say her voice is a little lower than mine. Um, and there's, there's kind of like an undertone of warmth. If she could get anybody to talk to her on any subject at any time in any situation. And that was something my dad did also. So I just never had this fear of talking to people. Um, but I think for, for mom's voice, it was, it was, um, it was one of those voices that just goes right to the middle of your soul. Mm. And it, it, it's really hard to describe that. It was resonant. Um, it was one of those voices like, if you weren't feeling well, it would her voice would just surround you. Mm. And maybe that's what I'm getting by the warmth and the richness, you know, like a like a warm fuzzy blanket. It's funny. I'm I'm always sensitive to when people are speaking. Mm -hmm. And I'm and I'm always tuning into the energy which carries the words. And there were a few moments since we've started, I closed my eyes and I really felt your warmth and I could feel different textures from you. Mm. And, and, and I can't help but think that maybe you project. It's easy to project something onto someone, but to what degree can we see ourselves and give ourselves that same uh, description in this case? And so whatever you said about your mother, is not so far fetched as to how I'm experiencing you right now. Like when you came on, I was like, "Wow, we're gonna have fun today." <laughs> <laughs> well, well, let me ask you then: what what textures do you hear? I would I would say the textures that I feel like feel. they they touch me here, mm. and I I don't. Sometimes I might be sensitive to people in a way of contraction. I only feel expansion right now. Interesting. And, and he's also very sensitive. So. But I didn't see her when she spoke, Bambos. You feel her? No, no, no. I, I, As you described your mom, I had a visceral experience of seeing the woman in the Matrix who played the Oracle. Oh. Like when you talked about her, I felt like, oh, I know your mom now. Because that was exactly the voice that, that hit me in that character. That's, That's really interesting. Um, my mom weighed about 80 pounds, tiny little thing, soaking wet. And before she passed, she had silvery white hair that I always wanted to stick my hands in. 
Like, oh, it's so soft. Um, but it, I, you know, I guess maybe it was just her kindness and her values and the things that she taught me was really, you know, have lasted me my life. She and my dad both, you know, just be good to people, you know, treat people well. And maybe, maybe it's a culmination of all those things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. A straight shooter. Yeah. You know, she will tell you if you are off base. I don't do that as much as she does. No. <laughs> I think you just mm. did. <laughs> well, it depends on how, how, how far off you may go. Right. Yeah. So yeah, she, she was straight, you know, and so was my dad. It was just like, you always knew where you stood with them, which, you know, you can appreciate because mm-hmm. you never have to guess. Yeah. There but I grew a- up on a farm in Southern Indiana. So, you know, oh. <clears throat> that kind of, maybe that kind of gives you some, you know, insight into how I grew up. You know, it gives a lot of insight. I spend way too much time in Bloomington, Indiana. So oh, I really? Know. Yes. I'm there well, I there. won't hold that IU thing against you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I have no <laughs> idea what you guys are it's, talking about. It's a little it's a little island of 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 liberal and a mass of uh, of conservative. <laughs> well, the whole thing about <clears throat> Bloomington a, in, is in, the whole Indiana, Indiana University. University. Yeah. Yeah. And since I'm a Purdue University graduate, we like hated each other, mm. you know. So you know, I don't much appreciate Indiana University. I don't but know. It, I don't know much about. It. I just work. Uh, I work uh, consulting services there. That's why. Okay. I, okay. I didn't go to. I went to UC Irvine, where basically it's just you know a lot of anteaters. We don't have any real image of anything. <laughs> um, I want to know. When you do voice over work and teach others, is it often for speaking or is it also for acting and character role portrayal? So is it how where's the boundary between you teaching people how to act and you teaching people how to project their voice stronger? Like where's that that line? Okay, so the whole thing with teaching voice, voice over. Uh, and it's interesting you asked me that because I'm kind of doing a couple things right now. So I started the Milligan Vocal Arts Institute probably, let's see, well, that was back in 2012. Mm-hmm. And my original goal was to work with people who use their spoken human voice in creativity, in creative uh, situations, or uh, if you use it in business professionally. Mm-hmm. So I had identified like 30 different vocal genres that all use their voices in very different ways. So for example- well, Slow down, slow down, slow down. I don't wanna to jump too quickly over what you're saying. Mm-hmm. So in your creation of the school, mm-hmm. you took voices and you categorized voices into 30 different genres of voices. Yes, yes. That's, that's the stuff for one moment, that's crazy. So what's my voice in your uh-huh. genre? Do you have that? Can you tell me what my voice is? You are a podcaster right? That uses their voice professionally. Oh, that's okay. Where, that's oh, what I, I know of you now. Oh, sorry. I, I had a whole different, I thought we were like talking about like how Eskimos have different ways for snow. So Andy, you've got a 3.218 voice. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Well, well, now I'm working on that typing and classification right now. That's my big, huge project I'm working on right now. Wow. But as far as creative and professional, uh, and, and I kind of hesitate to use, I'm just going to use business because there are a lot of people who use their voice creatively in a very professional way. Okay, so for example, creatively, vocal genres include, of course, singers, actors, voiceover, comedian, impersonators, uh, storytellers, uh, rappers. They all use their voice in a very creative way. Mm-hmm. Now, on the business side, uh, I work with ministers, attorneys, teachers, uh, sales professionals, executives. They all use their voices in more of a business setting. Mm-hmm. Right. So, you know, even within those genres of voice, for example, voiceover, uh, there are tons of 
genres within that, right? So you've got audiobook narrators. And within audiobook narrators, we can go even further. You've got romance novel, kids, teens, wow. uh, self help, you've got business, um, fiction, nonfiction, it goes on and on and on. Wow. Right. I've and seen your brain. I've seen your brain as like this library of categories <laughs> and subcategories. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah. And each person who performs their voice or uses their voice in those ways has to use it differently. Uh, and so if we just take commercial voiceover, for example, you know, you could be asked to have a character voice in a television co commercial. If you've ever seen the Windex commercial where the birds are talking, right? When one bird flies into the window and they're like, oh, I'm using Windex. <laughs> or there's a, a commercial out now for a CeraVe lotion and the character voice is a woman's skin. And the skin is talking to you. I need, you know, the ceramides and blah, 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 blah. So uh, you got the bears on wow. the Charmin com commercial. So even within commercial voiceover work, there can be a lot of mm. different character voices and you have to do something different. Okay, so in addition to character voices, you've got video games, tons of character work, right? Wow. Anime, animated, you know, shorts, stop motion uh, videos, all those could demand a certain character. Mm -hmm. But I also think just in general, when we have narrators, then, you know, I think a narration, the voice of an announcer is, could be a character, especially if that's not, I mean, we don't always talk in our announced voice. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the blah, blah, blah theater. You know, yeah. I don't normally say that, <laughs> right? But if someone you know wanted me to do that, there's a lot I could play with as far as creating that persona that or that character, right? And on voicemail, wow. you hear a lot of different voicemails where maybe character voices are used. So you have reached the voicemail of Aslan. Bambas, I see you've got a burning question. What's in you right now? Uh, I like you. You've said so much. Yeah, a lot. And I'm getting so many images and scenarios that you, I. Do you want notes? Do you want me to give you a page take notes? Actually, look, 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 right here, right here. <laughs> um, when we talk about salespeople, right? Mm -hmm. They they have to kind of step out of the way to be able to connect with people. And I'm wondering, what are some of the steps you will facilitate someone? to to get more centered when making a sale not like being forceful or not being too timid okay so the, the key mm. that i teach when it comes to voiceover is to be authentic you need to be you even if you are creating a character because that voice is coming out of your body mm. so i say there is no good voiceover unless there is a human to human connection mm. so if i am voicing something, if I'm not speaking directly to one human being, then I think I've lost my audience. Yeah. Right? And so that's where acting comes in, right? Now, I am i wouldn't consider myself an acting teacher, but acting is involved. And, you know, I if I have a script and I'm working with someone, if I'm coaching someone on a script, uh, I get them to read through the script to understand what is being sold or what the purpose of the of the voiceover is, right? Mm -hmm. So once you understand the content, um, then you can decide. Okay, so here's a perfect example. I had a student, well, it, it was an older gentleman and he had a really great deep voice and we had a script for vodka. And it was a very short script. And so he's reading this script. The sound of his voice is great, but you could tell there was no connection. And it's, it, that's something that's really kind of, um, you know it when you hear it, but if you yeah. don't hear it, you might not be able to put your finger on exactly what it is. So he read this, this spot and it was really short. And I was like, okay, that's really cool. But I had been teaching that you need to have a target audience person. So I asked the question, um, who are you talking to? And generally people say, oh, I'm just talking to everybody who wants to buy blah, 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 gin, right? Yeah. And um, 
I said, well, you got to narrow that down because here's, here's what happens. We take advantage of the fact that people are inherently nosy. So you need to choose one person that you can speak to about this gin or vodka or whatever, right? Doesn't matter who it is. You don't have to tell me who it is. You just need to know one person, right? So if I was talking to you in my mind and I said, you know, hey, Andy, blah, 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 you know, you really need to try this gin. Now, because people are nosy, they think that you're talking to them. Wow. It's kind of a Jedi mind trick. I understand. Yeah. So, it, but if I'm not talking to you and I'm just saying it, and, you know, most of the time people say they talk, they're talking to everybody, that just doesn't work because it doesn't connect with a human being. And yeah. then, so, okay, so this guy gets his, his person and he's, he reads it again. And there was just something that was really strange about it. I'm like, <laughs> it's, like it's my alcoholic dad. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, dude, what, who are you talking to? And he said, my four-year-old granddaughter. I was like, oh my God. Wow. <laughs> now the reason he did that is because the, the work, the commercial that we had done just before that was ice cream. Uh, and so he had read the spot as if he was talking to his granddaughter, right? And it was amazing. But he thought that he could just maintain that same person and hold her in his mind because mm. of course he loves his granddaughter and she's so cute and blah, blah, blah. So that's... <laughs> so Cindy, you're a genius. <laughs> well, I don't know about that, but I'll take it. Thank you. <laughs> but that's you know, not really so genius. It's really... That's really acting boiled down to its basic, mm -hmm. right? So I said to him, I said, you can't use your four-year-old granddaughter for every spot because she's not the appropriate target <laughs> person. <laughs> oh, okay. I of get course. It. Right. You know, she, he says she's going to drink vodka at some point in her at life. Point, right. <laughs> so like, not right now, because mm -hmm. in his mind, he sees what she's looks what she looks like and who she mm, is. Mm. And he speaks to her in a certain way. And he just would not say those, you know, words to this, you know, to his granddaughter. So it was such a perfect learning example because that target audience person, that one person that you can speak to makes or breaks the whole mm. spot. And that's really the key to voiceover. It, Bottom it's line. It, can I? Uh, yeah, sure. It's funny because the, the, I, uh, Bambos is always very generous in making sure that he raises two books as I talk. So I have uh, two books uh -huh. and I tried to voice over the first book a bit. And okay. it was it was it was a horrible experience. It was, Why was it horrible? Because I didn't have that person that you're that you were speaking about. And my wife says, Andy, you've got to read the book as if you're reading it to our nieces that are like, you know, five and seven. Mm -hmm. So then I start reading it as I'm reading it to them. And then I feel like such an idiot because I can hear my voice like saying, you know, like almost in that sweet voice, like, hey, yeah. there was a princess and he went to the, you know, and so I could. And then she loved it, which made me feel even more like I can't do this. I just can't do this. Um, was, was the content not appropriate for their age? The content, no. I mean, I'm talking about my mom being killed by a drunk driver. You know, it's not oh, like a, it's not like that's the voice that I resonated with to discuss with a four year old, right? So, okay. and it was interesting in the second book, which I actually did voice over, mm -hmm. which uh, which was a very different experience. I actually read it as if I was reading it to Bambos. So, uh, so in that sense, it was much easier read because. I was speaking and I his, he's always very loving eyes. And so it's more like kind of sharing it with a friend who I know is going to appreciate it. Mm -hmm. So that was a different feeling. Mm -hmm. And the funny thing is, though, the first book, when you read it to me, it did feel like because I heard a little bit from then. And I and I did hear like a story. Like I told him your voice like a bedtime storyteller. But I enjoyed it because regardless if it was a gen that storytelling voice, mm -hmm. 
I could feel the emotion as he read it. So as he mm -hmm. read it, if I felt if he felt the tears, I felt the tears. Yeah. And I, I really enjoyed listening in that way. Yeah. yeah. See, that's the kind of response you want, right? You're gonna redo but it. that was for the first book or the second book? The first book. Oh yeah. Okay. The first book. That, that's why we're gonna redo it. Yeah. Okay. We talked about it already. Yeah. But you know what? I think I think I'll cry during it, which which will be fine. I think it was a bit too close. It was too it was too raw to mm. read it. The the it was like I wrote the book quickly. I did a tour of the U.S. really quickly. There was so much going on, and it was so raw that reading it was like there was no boundary between where am I like fully like feeling naked on a stage and uh, and able to manage you know just holding my own voice. So it was right. a bit too close to home then. Mm. Yeah. Right. Well, now you have a different perspective, right? Yeah. So just that authentic, believable voice is what people want to hear, right? Yeah. So it doesn't matter who you're reading to. It really doesn't matter. But that's what I call the mental game of voice. It's your voice skills IQ, as, as another way of saying it, is you have to know who you're speaking to in order to communicate really effectively. Right. So my best friend, you know, I may speak to her in incomplete sentences because we know each other that well. Yeah. She can finish my sentences and I can finish her sentences or we could hear something and just completely burst out laughing because we kind of get that. Yeah. Right. But there's other people that I work with in business that there's no way I could talk to them that way because they would think I was a mad, crazy maniac, right? So I've got a, I've got a random question. Uh huh. Does anyone like their own voice? Oh, that's a really good question. <laughs> I, I used to hate the sound of my voice. And that was when, that was before I started working with this voice coach. And interestingly enough, I was hosting a talk show at the time and hated the way I sounded. Mm. And it's it's kind of unique because when you listen to your voice, you are an audience of one. You are the only person that hears your voice the way you hear it. And that's because when you speak, the sound is coming this way, right? Whether you have some sound that comes through your nasal passages and some most of your mouth most of your sounds come through your mouth. So sound is coming this direction. Well, your ears are over here. So the sound has to travel around this way, right? Through bones, flesh, skin, blood, all the things that make up your skull, right? And you're hearing your sound really muffled. But when you speak, it can come directly to me and I can hear you more clearly then you can hear yourself. So that's something that, you know, people don't really realize is they're not really hearing themselves the way other people hear you. And I'll give you another mom comment. This is a momism. There was at one point that I was really down on myself. I've been going through a lot of crazy stuff with the exes, but we're going to leave that alone. <laughs> but, but she said, Cindy, you know, you can't see yourself the way other people see you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I knew she was just being mom. I'm like, mom, you're just being mom. You're just trying to encourage me. That's not really helping right now. And she said, no, you can't see yourself the way other people see you. And then I was went into my smart aleck mode and said, well, I can see myself if I'm looking at a mirror. And she said, no, what you see when you look in, your, in a mirror is a reflection of yourself. And I was like, okay. <laughs> drop the mic. Yep. That was a mic drop moment, right? Yep. But it really applies to hearing too. You can't hear yourself the way you other people hear you. And if someone says, well, I can hear a recording. Well, that's even worse because now you're going through all that immediated electronic stuff that mm. definitely alters the sound of your voice. So you still can't hear yourself the way other people hear you because you're hearing a recording of yourself. Yeah. Yes. Full circle back to what I said in the beginning. Mm -hmm. What's that? Okay. That I felt everything you said about your mother is how I experienced you. Nice. Ah. 
Do I drop the mic again? I'm good. Drop the mic. Bam. What does it mean if your wife tells you that you talk too much? <laughs> <laughs> Don't go there. Don't go there. Translation. <laughs> that equals you talk to him. I'm not listening enough. What'd you say? Not okay. Yet. We have Paul along in uh, South Africa who's with us every day. He, he's the person we actually talk to most of the time. Yeah, we actually do the show so we can be with Paul along every day. Bola. When I when I project my voice to reach the whole audience, it drains my energy. Mm. My normal voice is lazy, but I'm told it is not my voice, but a voice I'm used to. I think that's accurate. Yeah. Right. Because he's not hearing him. Bola, can, can he hear me right Yeah, now? he's here. He's listening. Okay. He's right with. He's with us. Okay. So I would say you are listening to your voice through a lot of flesh, bones, blood, tissue, all that. So you're not hearing yourself that other way. But if you can just get focused on talking to one person, mm -hmm. that's a different thing because if you're trying to reach a whole audience, then you become what we call using your announcer voice. And people really don't want to be announced to. Yeah. Right? They want me, they yeah. want you to talk to them just like you're sitting down in the living room having a one-on-one -on, -one on conversation. And you can do that in public speaking, right? Mm -hmm. So that again is a very different type of thing because, and you asked me about that in the beginning, is the differences between doing voiceover where you're really only talking to someone in your mind yeah. versus public speaking. You've got, you could have an audience of 10, you could have an audience of 10,000, but you have to speak to individuals in that audience for your voice to be really authentic and yeah. for people to be able to connect with you and you to be able to connect with them. Yeah. You, you've, mm. you've really helped me with something that, I, that I've been struggling for a while. Sometimes I'll ask Andy to film me when I'm doing promotional things for my work. Mm -hmm. And one of the most biggest challenges I've had was to promote my, my, my passions and my business and find the words. And when, when I heard you say, speak to someone specifically, mm -hmm. I felt very peaceful at the idea of doing that again, because I feel that I'll be more embodied when I'm doing it and I'm not trying not trying too hard. And you know, for public speakers, that's the one thing I teach to get rid of that anxiety. Because if you speak, if you're speaking one-on-one -on -one person, are you generally nervous? No, but if you think all of a sudden now you have uh, 50,000 people you've got to talk to, how do you do that in an audience that big? Well, you just talk to one person. So you're going to say part of your sentence, hello, blah, 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 to this one person, and then come over here and talk to this person and finish the sentence, and then talk to some person in the back of the room. And you can, you can focus on different people at different times. And now your focus is more on speaking directly to them versus the nervousness and the anxiety that you may feel in a public speaking situation. So you can't look at them as a big, gigantic audience. You have to look at them as individual people, which they are. I, I, if I put myself in that situation, I feel that there needs to be presence in me and the breath like, OK, mm -hmm. now I'm going to go over here and really to have that spaciousness. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, it's like a superpower. I can't wait to use this. Thank you. <laughs> It's really very simple, right? Now, you've probably heard people say, oh, imagine this guy in his underwear or, you know, imagine this guy. I, know. <laughs> I photographed him naked a few days ago, so. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't need to imagine underwear. He's seen the whole, the whole thing. Oh, I've, seen, okay. I've seen all that. <laughs> and a bag of chips. And a bag of chips. Well, imagine, imagine if you're giving a really serious talk your brain can't do all of that at the same time, right? You want to you uh, bet? Really? Did you do it? <laughs> no, I'm, this was a joke. Continue. Oh. Mm. Well, I mean, that's really not going to help you because, you know, that's too much to for your brain to process. 
you still need to be focused on the message, but it's like the message that you are giving is so important, right? It's like, if you're trying to stop a little kid from running into the middle of the street, I always use this uh, example with my nephew, took him to Chuck E. Cheese one day, just as a surprise, right? We drive up into the parking lot of Chuck E. Cheese and he flips out, oh my God, we're going to Chuck E. Cheese. And before I could pull into a parking spot, he had flung open the door, right? He had un unfastened his seatbelt, flung up the door and was running across the parking lot, right? Now, in that moment, my focus, I could care less about my car. I flung open the door myself and I went after him. Didn't care that my purse was there, didn't care what happened with the car, didn't care if it was parked properly or anything like that. I had to stop him. So my focus at that time was very different. It had to change immediately. It was a life and death situation, literally. Fortunately, I grabbed him and, you know, everything was okay. You but, used your vocal cap capacity at that moment to let him know he didn't do the right thing. Man, everything was coming out of my voice. Anger, fear, relief. Yeah. Oh, my God. Mm. You know, mm. all the stuff that you would feel, right? You just ruined our trip to Chuck E. Cheese. No, I mean, it ended up great. <laughs> but the point is, so many people are thinking about so many different things. They're worried about how they look. They're worried about how they sound. They're worried about their message. Mm-hmm. And most people in an audience just are trying to get the core things, right? I mean, yeah. unless for some reason your hair is crazy, you know, you're wearing broken glasses or whatever. But if you're wearing bro broken glasses for a reason, then that may work. Yeah. Mm. But the key is to connect with people and just tell them, realize what you have to say is really, really important and you need this information. Yeah. You know, and it'll come across as authentic. I'm writing the, the 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 next book as we speak, and it's a lot on communications. And the funny thing is, the challenge in that is that I see so many exceptions to all the things I'm saying as I'm writing it. So I already laugh because as I write, I, I'll sometimes write, so whatever I said in the last chapter wasn't altogether true. So, I mean, so it's almost like, let me state it. And then I see sometimes the exception is important enough to clarify in another, mm -hmm. in another chapter. So as I hear you speak, I, I can resonate very much with, uh, with that, that way of seeing things as well. Right. Yeah, and I'm not sure exactly what you're writing, what, writing about, but what I would suggest mm -hmm. is, is if there is a visual way that you can get people to visualize something, some element, then that connect, that could also connect. Yeah. Right? I do that all the time. Yeah. yeah. I, as much as I can, I try to bring in graphs to try to satisfy the logical side. I try to bring examples in of people actually interacting to deal with the emotional side, because you need to kind of satisfy both the kind of the more determined minded mind and the more give me examples. So I know really what we're talking about. It's it's right. not, it's not easy to write to those two well, because it's like, it's what I, it's what I like to do, but I often have found people prefer one or the other. It's mm -hmm. like, give me a romance novel or give me a self-help book, but don't try to mix the two. <laughs> unless, unless you bring a person in uh -huh. and you tell a story using a person. It's yes. because we're so doggone nosy. Yeah. We well, won't then you're, know you're, what really happened. Then you're the alchemist. I, I, I'm a, unfortunately, I'm not able to write like what's his name, Paula, Paula Paulo Cuerto. Cuerto. Yes. Cuelo. Yes, Cuelo. Yes. Yeah. Um, I have an interesting thing following up from what you said from Bolalong as well. It says so. The advice given to nervous speakers is not correct because they're told to look above the audience. Oh God, <laughs> definitely not. <laughs> did, did you see that? No, that's a big no. That's Bolalong. a big no, Bola Long. Yes. <laughs> Bola Long, do not do that because it's really difficult to focus on something. And if you're talking to a wall, there's no real connection that you can make with a wall mm. unless you see the wall as some sort of individual or a character. But it's better to connect with people. And if you're focusing on a point above the wall, depending yeah. on how big your audience is, 
they're going to be wondering what the heck you're looking what at. What the hell you're looking at? What are you looking at? The clock? Are you worried about the time? What's going yeah, on like, here? Yeah, what's back there, right? <laughs> it's so much better to focus on people. Look them in their eyes, right? Mm. Um, yeah. if you're, if you're talking to a smaller audience, it's so much easier, you know, to just look at it as, you know, you're just having a conversation with several different people. Mm. But if you're trying to aim at a point on the wall yeah. in the back of the room, it, it's prob unless it is a point, it's still hard to focus on one thing. So people are better. You got to have the human, human to connect human. Who's to your human. favorite voice? Who's your favorite voice in the world right now? I would say Oprah has the best voice ever. Really? Oprah? You went to Oprah? I went to Amazing. Oprah. And why Oprah? Tell me why Oprah. Oprah is so articulate and she's so authentic. Uh, very I dear. don't feel like Oprah is lying to me. Ah, that's how you use it. Okay. You know who I have in my mind is the guy who does the intro for CNN. Oh. You know what his name is? He's the is that, well, is that James Earl Jones does all the scenes. James Earl Jones. That's the one. <laughs> yeah. James Earl Jones has an incredible voice, right? I I would trust anything that guy had to say. I can tell you that. He makes you a know ton James of Earl Jones. Oh, okay. Yeah. C Cindy. I'll You're tell you who he is for, for for reference in the uh animated version of The Lion King. He's Mufasa. Really? That's him. You, did she just make a pop, ref, pop reference that you understood? Well, she said that the CNN guy is the Lion King, Mufasa. Yeah. yeah. I know Mufasa, so, okay. I want you to know, Cindy, I make pop references every day on this show. Bambos looks at me like th these eyes, like I'm speaking a foreign language. So I, this, I, I don't watch. This is amazing to me. So this is impressive. This is a moment. And I'll tell you who else he is. Star Wars. Star Wars Bambos. Who? Darth Vader. Darth Vader. Bambos. No. Yes. Awesome. There's a and, story about him, Darth and, Vader. And he's the king in coming to America, Bambos. Yes, he is. Very good, Bolo Long. Thank you. Bolo, very good, Bolo Long. Got another one in there. I Love bet it. he Googled that one. <laughs> <laughs> you I'm hear sorry, it all the time. Here all the time. Yes. Yeah. Now, the only thing I can say about James Earl Jones, he is on my list of top voice talent. However, I've never really been able to hear him have a conversation that's not in an, a performance type of situation. Mm. You see what I mean? Yeah. So because I've heard Oprah in many different ways, sure. that's why I talk about that on authenticity. I hear her have regular conversations with people and that's authentic. But then when she's performing, she's still that authentic. Yeah. yeah. Right now, James Earl Jones, his story is incredible because he used to stutter. And now wow. he's like probably the top paid voice actor ever. Fascinating. Because as the announcer for CNN, he makes serious bank. Wow. 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 <laughs> I stalked Oprah. I went to her house and walked around to see if you I could stalked drop. Her. I stalked her. I went, I walked around her house, saw if I could leave a book because I had the book to her. And I uh -huh. thought, I'm going to leave a book at her door. And I took the book and that the security guard saw me sort of walk anywhere near that mailbox. He says, don't even think about it. That's all he said was don't even think about it. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Well, I but understood afterwards. Close. What? You got close. Yeah, I got close. And I wrote a chapter in the book that didn't make it, but that was that. Oh, yeah. wow. Yeah. Interesting. So you see how that story just, it it's magnetic. You stalked off Oprah? <laughs> you what? And you know what the worst thing was? I didn't even tell you about this. This is a funny one. I don't know if it was her or somebody else, but they drove up in the Tesla. They went in and I see the car going in. I can't see who's in it. And then they stop halfway in the driveway. And I don't know if they're looking in the rear view mirror and seeing me or what, but I just stopped there. And I think to myself, in a weird way, now I really feel like a stalker because if she's looking at me, she's probably <laughs> not looking at me thinking, this is a nice guy who has something. She's probably worried for death. Like, what is this guy doing? And what is that? what's that in his hands? 
Exactly. Ooh. Yeah. So Oprah, sorry, if you're listening. My apologies. He wanted to give you this book. Yeah, I wanted to give you this book. I signed it. I made a really nice thing. I actually gave it to a woman who knew where Oprah has dinner. And, and, and I gave it to her that day. And she brought it to the restaurant. And I don't even know if it and made it. And he's not a stalker. Oprah. No. Oh, wow. uh, You're not generally a stalker. No, not in general. But specific in some instances. But specific. In some <laughs> you Cindy. will specifically stalk Oprah. <laughs> Cindy, on your journey, like being aware of your own voice, have you have you noticed an expansion of your voice or a deepening of your voice as you worked through your exes or emotional challenges? Yes. And I'm asking this question just because I also see that the more oh. I mm. emotionally release, mm. I do feel I claim myself in a much grounded way. Yeah. Yes. Well, I'll tell you what opened my eyes originally to that whole idea is that when I was hosting this talk show, it hurt me to talk. Literally pain, right? Where? where? In the throat area. Mm. And I had a lot of tension in my neck. And so mm. I sought the help of a voice teacher, which was really difficult to find because when I looked for a voice teacher, all I kept finding was singing coaches, right? Oh, yeah. Which I was not interested in. I needed someone to help me with the spoken human voice, which is why that's one of the reasons I, I focus on that right now. But I found this vo vocal coach in uh, Oakland, California, because at the time I was hosting this talk show for KTVU, which is in Oakland, San Francisco area. And what I found out when I first started working with her is I was breathing wrong. Mm. You think, well, how in the world can you breathe wrong? I mean, I'm breathing, I'm alive, I'm walking around but I wasn't breathing from the proper place. Mm. And I was doing a lot of upper Perfect. chest, shallow mm. breathing. I wasn't using my lower body. Uh. And, and when I learned to breathe properly, I expanded my whole entire range. And that's when my voice went from being up here, I'm like this always strained because I didn't have enough air to where it is now. And you've probably heard people say, oh, you should breathe from the diaphragm. You should breathe yeah. from the diaphragm. Have you heard that before? Obviously. Don't do that. I don't know where the diaphragm is, but I know I'm supposed to do that. Exactly. My, <laughs> exactly. Most people do not know where the diaphragm is. So how are you supposed to breathe from there? Okay, so let me just give you another little clue here. The diaphragm is a muscle that is the floor of your chest cavity and the ceiling of your abdominal cavity, right? Okay. So if you if you can imagine, right, my if you can see my hand, it's like probably right here. But if you really can breathe from the lower body and expand your lower body and get air, then you've got your entire torso that becomes a resonant cavity. I want you to, I want to sit with that for one moment because you said something so powerful. I don't want to just go to the next sentence too quickly. You're telling me that by bringing the air lower, I'm utilizing more of the things that are internal to vibrate, which then comes out in my voice. Yes. Fascinating. Bottom line. Totally changed the sound of my voice. Is that it's what a like, singer would do, by the way? I've never really yes. thought of that. That's what a yes. singer does. So they they actually are using internal kind of, we call it their, their trachea. Or I don't know what that word is that's in there. Well, okay, so you have resonators in your body, right? Resonators create fuller, warmer, richer sound. And your chest cavity is a resonator. Your vocal tract is a resonator, right? Your mouth is a resonator, your nasal cavity, sinus cavities, anywhere there's space, right? It's like you walk into a cave and all you wanna do is hello, hello, hello. It just resonates and, and echoes, right? The sound is yeah. back, bouncing back and forth. Well, imagine, right? So if you have a bottle and like a, you know, you put uh, water in like a Coke bottle. If you fill the bottle all the way up and you blow across the top, you're gonna get kind of a higher pitch sound. If you don't put as much water in it, right, then now you've created more space. 
And when you blow across the top of it, it's a lower sound, gives yeah. you a lower pitch. So it's the same thing with your, with your, well, I'll just say torso. So if you can breathe from the lower body and you have more space for the air to resonate before it even comes up, wow. right? So it's just proper breathing because you can't, you can't speak unless you have breath. Mm. And you always mm. speak on the exhale. Yeah. You can't speak as you're inhaling. Mm. Give it a try. <laughs> All right. You can't talk. So breath is the foundation of voice. And if you're not breathing properly, and what the other thing that I was doing is I was holding my breath a lot, and which I didn't realize. I was doing an interview for one of the news segments that I was producing at the time. And I was talking to this doctor and he said, so Cindy, why do you hold your breath? I'm like, what are you talking about? I don't hold my breath. Yeah. You hold your breath. No, I got into an argument with this guy. <laughs> and then you're like I sucking in the air. I don't hold my breath. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? I'm alive. I'm sitting here talking to you. He goes, yeah, you hold your breath when you listen. Mm. And so he said, just pay attention to it over the next week. Right. Mm. And guess what? He was right. I was holding my breath all the time. So not only was I not breathing from the proper place, I was holding my breath a lot, which caused me to have headaches. I was always having headaches. I had all this tension in my neck. I had, you know, all this tension here in my neck and my throat. And I just could not, I would have never, ever thought that was why. Yeah. So you're saying something that's like so clear to me and yet I've never had it like brought back in this shape and form. You know, whenever you're in the training, there'll always be that moment when there's this huge tension and mm -hmm. the tension is palpable. Everyone feels it and everyone's holding their breath yeah. and you're just sitting there and like everyone's the tension. No, no one, no one wants to breathe because even that might, might set off something that no one wants to see or, and it's interesting that they have that one person in the group might be conscious enough that says, everyone, let's breathe now. Just take a breath. Yeah. And um, and 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 I uh, I see that if I'm not breathing, I'm not centering myself at all. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, so when I first started working with this vocal coach, um, I think I worked for her about eight or nine months every week. And every time I came into her studio, She's like, lie down on the floor. 99% of my voice training was on the floor because if you're in a supine position, which is flat on your back, you are going to breathe from the right place. Wow. If you put a baby on its back in a crib, you're only going to see the lower body moving. You never see this. Mm. They never do this. Can't do it. But if you're flat on your back in a supine position and you take a deep breath, then just check in your body where the like the apex of that physical breath in your body. So if you take a breath from the lower body, I guarantee you it's going to be below your belly button. Wow. And when it's when it's that low, that means you have a lot of space to make more resonant sound. And it keeps all this relaxed, mm. right? So the best voice you can possibly create, back to your point about that collective sigh of relief, the best voice you can create in your body is comes out of relaxation, a relaxed mm. body. So the more you can keep, especially this area, relaxed, the better sound you're going to create. Mm. When I did the voiceover for the book, I stood up. Because I felt immediately there was a relaxation and a way of, of speaking that was different than if I'm sitting behind the computer reading things. It shifted yes. immediately. Yes. I always stand and generally barefoot. Oh, wow. And barefoot. Round. What's that? Grounding. Yeah. Grounding. We, we, we yeah. talked about it. Yeah. Absolutely. I, found I feel totally grounded. Mm. And I can be really comfortable standing. And plus, it's, it's allowing the air a straight flow. Right. Mm. For military people, they call it the gig, the gig line. 
right? It's the, the line that if you had a shirt that was buttoned and it goes down to the button in your pants and the zipper, that line needs to be straight so that air has an easy way. It's not constricted in any way. Hmm. It's so funny. Like during the show, as you're speaking, I just feel myself correcting everything and adjusting. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's I, easy to do, right? I feel myself yawning a lot. Like I already want to lie down and sort of breathe into my belly. You know, I'm like, oh, wow, this feels very comfy. Uh, okay. And we're going to do that one. <laughs> okay. You've been following me. You guys have been stalking me, haven't you? Uh, why? <laughs> just last week, I posted some content on my social media about the six benefits of yawning for your voice. Mm. Yawning is really good for you. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> See? Yeah. <laughs> contagious. It's, it's contagious, right? It's contagious and it's uncontrollable, right? How many yawn just now? Comment below. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> good, good point. So, so the thing is, yeah, I'm, I have some feline friends. There you go. Give us a big yell. Uh, right? You get a quick influx of air, yeah. right? And then when you yawn, this hinge, if you're really opening your mouth, the hinge, like right with your jaw, you can feel that. It opens and releases and creates more space. Yeah. And when you have more space, right, then you can be more resonant. Mm. It also, like that cool influx of air, it sends spinal fluid from to flow down, cools the brain. Because what happens is a lot of times when people really either get sleepy, get tired, get bored, right? They just go into this relaxed state and their brain is not really, you know, firing on all, right? Yeah. So when you take that big influx of air, it like opens up everything and creates, you know, that this this effect of waking you up, mm. but it's really good for your voice. Just mm. for, just for no other reason than getting a lot of air in your body. Mm. I'm, I'm really loving the direction we took and, and also how you explained, you, you really put, you gave a new vocabulary to something that I've also been experiencing in a way of a few months ago, I had almost panic attacks. I was breathing, I felt contraction in my heart mm. and I felt suffocated in a way I felt helpless and I didn't know if I should, please forgive me, end it all, go to the doctor, get medicated. There was a kind of helplessness and I couldn't wow. see any solutions. Mm. And then I have a yoga mat in my living room and I'm like, breathe. So I sat down, I did a hundred minutes of this so-called four, seven, eight breath. Mm -hmm. And I did it for a hundred minutes. Wow. And when I came out of it, my legs were numb, of course. Yeah. But there was so much spaciousness that it, that I still couldn't put words to it. Like I was still like, oh, where, where did all those contractive thoughts go? So I've, I, I've been doing this every day now since then. Even Very And good. I've been feeling good. Mm -hmm. And I told Andy recently, I've been tapping into creativity where in the panic attack, I couldn't even tap into anything like I couldn't have gratitude, love, nothing. Yeah. So it's really beautiful now that you've given me another understanding of what I've been experiencing. Mm -hmm. it's, it's so simple. When I first started really learning about voice, I was like, Brett, that's just so simple. It can't be the answer. It That just cannot be the only thing, right? But it really, really has a profound effect on your a physical body mm. and your also your mental state too, right? Mm. And that whole thing about count to ten, no, skip that. Just sit down and breathe. Seriously, right? Yeah. It's such a big investment for your well-being, right? It is for for something so simple. And it's free. You don't have That's to go free. to get medicated. Mm. No therapy, at least in my context. I, no, yeah. I could imagine I could have done that, right? Right. But they probably would have, that was going to cost you, number one, right? Number two, they probably would have given you a prescription for something, which also would cost you. And now you've lost a lot of time where you could have invested that time and just, yeah, did some deep breathing. But, you know, I always tell people, if you ever get into that really stressful situation or that panic-like situation, 
just lay down on the floor mm. on your back. Oh yeah. Because on your back, you're going to breathe the way you were designed to breathe. Wow. Without effort. On yeah. Sunday, this past Sunday, I uh, I ventured out for a jog, which I hadn't done for a long time. Mm -hmm. We're, let's get that straight. Very long time. Very long time. <laughs> <laughs> but what I had done is I had been walking for the last, say, 70 days or something religiously every day, 10, 10 kilometers, 10 to 15, maybe 20. So a okay. lot of walking. So I've been preparing my body for this gradual step. And I thought, okay, I'm going to run to a park. It's about five kilometer jog. If I get halfway through it, I'm happy. Like I'm the fact I got out of the house was already like I did it this. But it's a win. What? It's a win. It's a win. Yeah. It was just yeah. getting out the door. Um, and what happened was was about uh, I guess a third way into it, I started to feel the the uh, body starting to contract. So I, st I, I felt my calf, I felt my hip. There was like, okay, now I, I see the machinery is not enjoying this experience. So, so it was very interesting that I really just focused on my breath. Like mm -hmm. I did not do anything. I just focused. I saw that I was far more breathing deeper, feeling the breath, uh, feeling as if the breath was giving me the energy, almost channeling the breath to keep to keep these things that weren't feeling all that well going. Right. And right. it was really interesting because of course you made it, you know, I made it to the halfway point and then those things started to release. And then the last half was actually very easy. So really it was like almost that third, that probably say one third in that one section was the point I needed to get through. So I could have that other half experience where my body was allowing it, it like surrendered and it was okay again. Right, but it, it was really. I felt like it was me staying in tune with my breath more than anything physical that I was actually doing. Right, you yeah. gave your 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 body some oxygen no. throughout, right, mm. and it responded. So, see, you know, it's it's crazy because there's just two simple things: air and water. Mm. So I can't tell you how important water is. Yeah. Right, so hydration of the whole body works to make everything better. But on the other side of that, <clears throat> dehydration does way more negative, has a greater negative impact than properly hydrating on the other side. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people think, well, if I just can't get all this water down, no big deal. Well, yeah, bigger deal than you can ever imagine with, you know, with dehydration, because yeah. dehydration, um, if you're, if you're having migraine head headaches, cheers, cheers. Yeah. If you're having migraine headaches, dehydration of the brain, oh, arthritis, wow. dehydration of the joint uh, of the joints and the bone, diabetes, de dehydration. You know, dry eyes, dehydration. Yeah, a lot of problems that we take mm -hmm. serious medication for is really just an issue of dehydration. Wow. And if you're thirsty, you're already dehydrated. <laughs> Dr. Cindy, we've already gone over our hour. Oh my God. What, what a time it's been. I think we should do another show in your exes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what I learned from my exes. And how I found my breath. <laughs> yes. You know what? I'll think about that. <laughs> There are probably what? some lessons on voice in that situation. Yeah. <laughs> what my mom warned me about, and it took me ages to come to, to peace with. Oh, I, have <laughs> I have a lot of those. Yeah. Thank you. It was great you being are with you. more than welcome. It was a great pleasure. Yeah. Absolutely. I look Thank forward so to much. finding another reason to have you on something. I, I had four topics I didn't get into, so we can maybe make a topic out of that. Yeah. Thank you. You're yes. welcome. Bye bye. 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 Uh, I think she likes me more. She blew me a kiss. So. I think so. She does, she knows uh, better. She knows that I'm the irreverent one, you know. Yeah. Wow. <sighs> There's a lot of things that touched me on this show. Uh, as I was um, watching, mm. I was like, I need to rewatch this one. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the the...
the question when I asked about about someone not liking their own voice and then then how one hears themselves and how you know we don't see or I, I actually saw it much broader than the fact that we don't hear the voice other people hear is already pretty clear because it's you know it's coming out of this but we're not listening to it in the same way others would hear it but it dawned on me as she was speaking like even the you gave me those headphones mm. those jawbone headphones which are basically they vibrate you put them, they don't go into your ear, but just the vibration is enough to pass through your jaw and then you hear. Yeah. And, uh, and it was very interesting for me because of course, you know, when you look at sound as just vibration and then realize you don't even need to put it in your ear, you'll hear if you just put it, a piece of, you know, a piece of plastic against a mm. temple and it vibrates a certain frequency, you'll hear music or whatever is coming out of it, which yeah. is... Yeah. There's a, there's another one for you. What's that? My friend Tamas has a waistcoat. Okay. And it has a me mechanism inside. And you hook up your music to this waistcoat. Okay. And as you're listening to the music, it vibrates. So your whole body gets the, the vibration of the music. So he let me listen to classical music. And I can tell you have to start dancing just by... So he when he goes running or whatever, he always wears that jacket. Wow. So I thought this would be nice for you. I saw that on, they advertised that for me always on Facebook. I think you should have it. Interesting. When is your birthday? <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you. It's Thursday. We have one more show this week. And we're, we're going to be off on Tuesday, Monday, Monday and Tuesday, Tuesday next because week. Because of King's Day. And Andy wants to spend time with his wife. Yes. And there's one more thing, guys. We are on 207 episodes. 207. Tomorrow we'll be with Farah. Oh, yes. Yeah, who's a dear friend, and we love her. Yes, we do. And she'll be talking about cheating. Cheating, how it is that cheating occurs, where she's experienced it in her own life. And we're going to dig into that subject, which I think is very, you know, it's edgy. I like it. It is edgy. Yeah. And there was something very beautiful. She she actually messaged and, and said, I don't know if I can do this show. when Because she saw the title, mm -hmm. and she had a reality, but then... Just knowing her and just trusting her process, uh, she said, "Let's talk in a few days." And then she's like, "I'm okay with it now." Oh, that's beautiful. Um, I have a favor to ask the audience. Mm -hmm. The first one is, please share. Yeah, our podcast. Uh, if you go onto the actual podcast platforms, these shows are being edited. Please share, like, follow, all of it, all of it. And I have a favor. I've, I've started a trend where I stop people on the street and I share the show and then I ask them to say, where are we going to do it on? And they say, wonderful okay. chaos. And so far, uh, I've also had like two foreigners who couldn't actually say, say it. the words. <laughs> but I'd like to receive videos and you guys can send it to our Facebook page in the messages mm. where you just say the words, I love a wonderful chaos. Oh, that's I, I want to make a compilation by, by episode 300. I want to put a whole thing together. I love that. And if you guys love and support us, please do it. Oh, I like how you're doing emotional blackmail. Emotional and if you don't love and support us, you won't do it. And we're not going. We're going to stop the show on 300. <laughs> uh, we'll so, see you tomorrow. And oh, you have so much else? more. Yes, you stopped the so much more shit. You're driving me crazy with your so much more crap. And also, you can also say a wonderful chaos and so much more. <laughs> Just to annoy Andy. <laughs> <laughs>